County and welcome to City Spotlight. This is our last City Spotlight of the year and so we're going to close it up and we're going to talk about cool congregations. We're going to go up to St. Paul's Episcopal Church and we're going to talk to the Reverend Kathleen Bascom and Sarah Webb who is co-founder of the Cool Congregations program. We're going to talk about sustainability and I think you'll enjoy this program. Stick right with us. We'll be right back. Visit Des Moines, we have it all. Welcome back. We're here at the Cathedral of St. Paul at 815 High Street, and there's more to a cathedral than meets the eye. And here with me right now is our first guest, Sarah Webb. Sarah, welcome to our show. Thank you. Let's talk a little bit about uh, interfaith power and light and all the good things that you're, you're working on. Okay. Uh, well, for starters, uh, Iowa Interfaith Power and Light, it's not a power company. <laughs> we lean on a different kind of power and light. Nobody's going to get a utility bill out, out of no, this, right? No one's getting yeah. a utility bill out of this. No, Iowa but It might be able to lower their utility bill. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Iowa Interfaith Power and Light is the joint response of faith communities in Iowa to climate change. We work to protect the earth and safeguard society's most vulnerable by helping congregations and individuals to lower their carbon footprints. We educate about climate change and the religious response. And we empower individuals to be advocates for clean energy and climate policies. Talk a little bit about um, a what your position is in the organization, but why is that so important? Well, my position with the organization is I'm the Cool Congregations Coordinator for Iowa Interfaith Power and Light. That is a mouthful. I run their Cool Congregations program, um, and I think it's really important um, as people of faith that we um, respond to climate change in an appropriate manner, which is to help prevent the emissions that cause climate change in the first place. So the Cool Congregations program um, helps individuals and congregations to do just that. Do you feel like you're, you're having success? I mean, uh, is this being taken up by a lot of the people that you come in contact with and is the word spreading or is there some resistance as people have sort of deflected and deferred now to the real issues, the economy. Hmm. Well, the people who come to our workshops, we've had representatives from over 200 congregations in Iowa attend our workshops over the last five years. And I could say probably that most people who attend our workshops are doing something, mm -hmm. whether it's recycling or weatherizing their homes or switching over their light bulbs or buying energy efficient cars. All, all of these things that they are doing are helping them to save money also. So it's sort of a win-win. You know, lower the amount of carbon emissions causing climate change and lower the bills that you pay for your energy. So it's a win-win situation. Well, and, and uh, it seems so important that we work on it um, individually and collectively, not only, yes. you know, in our own homes and mm -hmm. in our faith-based community and in our businesses and, and in our governments. It's, it's somewhat frustrating, at least from my standpoint, having worked on this um, a little bit, that you know, it, it is not something that uh, has uh, been accepted straight across the board when it seems like the consequences of doing nothing are so dire, given mm -hmm. uh, what recently came out in the Wall Street Journal that we have till 2017 to begin to uh, curtail our emissions on CO2, otherwise that 2.6 degrees Celsius and or the the uh, 
three to four degrees Fahrenheit that we're hoping to hold the uh, temperature increase to, uh, that our opportunity by 2017 will have passed and uh, not be able to, to do much about it. Mm -hmm. It seems like that's a pretty serious uh, consequence and uh, and there's getting to be even even some of the skeptics have stepped up and said there's a problem that's right there is a problem and as people of faith we are morally obligated to take action so we need to do all we can starting now and even if we don't succeed in keeping the temperature where we want it to be we still are morally obligated to take action to take care of our neighbors and to do what we can to care for the earth do you, think, do you think people are more moved, uh, at least in the faith-based area, by their stewardship responsibility or saving money? Hmm, that's a good question, because we like to encourage people to reach for that high moral ground as people of faith. That's our standing in society, you know? Um, but it doesn't hurt that people also save money, too. So. It almost, uh, um, you know, I heard recently as we did a number of years ago when we were uh, talking about this that, you know, there's sort of a uh, national security angle to this as well, especially as we w look for renewable uh, resources, whether it be solar or wind or geothermal or things like that, to, to use to heat and cool and light our society today and to um, know that we can do that with those alternative methods as opposed to going to all those fossil-based fossil fuels, whether it be coal or whether it be shale or whether it be oil. Mm -hmm. Do you think that uh, um, people are grasping those opportunities and in, in, in thinking that for whether it be stewardship uh, or just some sort of a, of a sense that they want to uh, have a future for their kids or grandkids that's at least as good or better than, than what we've had in our lifetimes, or some other national security reason are, are things for people to grab onto. Well, you know, I've, I, I ask at every workshop that I do, um, what's your motivation for doing something about climate change? And I have heard so many different stories. In Iowa, the top story is because they're concerned about the world that they are leaving to their grandchildren. That is the top story that I hear. I've also heard stories from um, people who are concerned about national security. They want to be able to provide their own homegrown energy so they don't have to worry about sending their young people to wars across the ocean. Um, people are are concerned about the economic welfare of the state of Iowa, so they want to make sure there's a lot of good alternative energy, like wind and solar, grown here in Iowa for their own use here in Iowa. Um, people are concerned about um, their health. Um, Coal-fired power plants can emit uh, particles that can trigger asthma attacks and cause respiratory and, and heart trouble in the elderly. Um, so I've heard so many, so many concerns. Um, people of Faith also do a lot of uh, relief work overseas, you mm -hmm. know, providing food to refugees and such. The number of climate refugees is skyrocketing, and people of Faith feel obliged to meet that need and find they cannot. How do you think, um, because I know that you, you work not only in Iowa, but um, around the country mm -hmm. and, and try to uh, um, help a lot of people get, get involved. How do you think is the best way for us to drive um, a, a broader based understanding of not only the, the situation and the consequences, but the education or to, to all people? How, how, how should we best try to get the message out? Well, we like working through the churches because Iowa is such a highly churched state. Mm -hmm. Lots and lots and lots of people go to church in Iowa where they don't always in other states. And people really believe in their faith here and, you know, want to act on their values. And so we think that's a great avenue to get the message out is through the churches. But um, actually, I'm working on another project called Cool Neighbors, which is a secular version of Cool Congregations mm -hmm. in Cedar Falls, where we are pitting neighborhood associations against each other in a contest to see which sure. one can save the most energy. 
And we're finding a lot of uh, participation, a lot of interest in that avenue as well. Sometimes it's good, keeping up with the Joneses is a good motivator. So. Well, we spend a lot of time in, in Des Moines uh, talking to neighborhoods uh, about what they can do. But of course, a lot of folks with the economy such as it is, will say, well, that's going to take a lot of money. We've got to figure out how, what are those first mm -hmm. little initial steps that can be taken. And I think that uh, I've seen lists that... that oh, yes. Mm, that's our most favorite handout. It's called yeah. 25 Steps Under $25. Mm -hmm. It's a great way to get started on saving energy without really investing much of anything. And then with the savings that you get from taking those actions, you can take those savings and apply them to more expensive investments in saving energy. So you gradually work your way up. Start with the low cost, go with the more cost, and always take advantage of what your utility has to offer you in the way of energy efficiency rebates and incentives. We try always to plug in the people who come to our workshops with the local utilities energy efficiency programs because that's uh, they have uh, upfront financing in some cases and rebates and all sorts of freebies and you never know what they have. You have to ask them, but look on the website. Do you, do you think that the, um, the work that you do is, is limited just to um, energy and those sorts of things or do you work also on sources of food like locally grown uh, mm. Food, you because mm -hmm. when we look at carbon footprints of, let's say, bringing our our foodstuffs from other continents, is really a, a highly energy intensive operation to, to raise it uh, mm -hmm. someplace else, thousands of miles mm -hmm. away, and then somehow ship it to Des Moines, Iowa, for instance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the average meal travels 1,500 miles to come to our plate here in Des Moines, so that's a lot of carbon emissions. Um, and the, how do we how do we, how do we deal work on locally grown uh, fresh foods? It's called Cool Harvest. You can use it in your congregations, and it's all about what we can do to reduce our carbon emissions from food. So I encourage people to look at that at the Interfaith Power and Light website. Um, but one of our Cool Congregations participants here in Des Moines, St. Tim's Episcopal Church, actually in West Des Moines, has started their Faith and Grace Garden, and they're, they have this huge garden that's growing every year, and they grow food locally for the food bank and in the process they're training up all these people who volunteer so they know how to garden and can grow food in their in their own gardens as well so we do encourage people to look as much as possible at buying local from your local farmers market or join the CSA community supported agriculture or grow your own food those are all things that people can do to reduce their carbon footprint from the transportation of food there are other things you can do too for instance um, People in Iowa don't like to hear this, but you can choose to eat less meat. Because worldwide, the United Nations figure says 18% of the carbon emissions worldwide comes from animal agriculture. There's a lot of emissions um, coming from the methane, which is far more potent than carbon dioxide, and all the water that's used to, uh, in the production of meat. So it's, uh, those are some things we can all do, starting um, in about an hour at the lunch table. So. <laughs> Well, and, and at dinner and, uh, and right. breakfast every day as well. So That's I think right. uh, certainly eating more healthy mm -hmm. is, is not only good for the environment, but yeah. it's probably good for our, our health as well. And good for the Iowa economy. That's right. Yep, That's right. Um, you know, as we, we talk about all these various aspects of, of what it is that uh, we can do and should do, I always keep thinking about whether or not we ought to also put it through our, our education system. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, when we walk in the, our kids walk in the classroom and they have a math problem, why aren't they calculating uh, uh, on, you know, on a mathematical formula mm -hmm. the carbon emissions of, of something? Mm -hmm. Or when they go into a uh, history class, Certainly, there's uh, some history related to when we started burning things and when we started uh, burning coal and when we started burning, uh, you know, oil products and, and how that all relates. Or, you know, if it's, uh, you know, in a, in a health class, talk about mm -hmm. the aspects of, of all these things. And that, that usually the young people pick it up really quick. And uh, it's those of us that are mature adults that think that we already have the answers sometimes that we're the slower learners, I think. Yeah, that's all right. We're the slower learners, but it's our responsibility. We're the grown-ups in this situation. So the children should be educated, but it's up to us to really lead the way in making the changes. 
Um, I know, for instance, at the university level, at UNI, I work out of the office. My office is in the Center for Energy and Environmental Education up there. I know that they're um, addressing that curriculum-wide, that the sustainability curriculum throughout the entire university curriculum up there now. Um, they've even used some of our materials from coal congregations to measure carbon footprints and take steps to reduce it. So it's happening. Thank you for being on uh, City Spotlight, and next will be Kathleen Bascom, and uh, we'll be right back. We're going to hope you find something on our uh, city calendar. City Spotlight. I hope you found something on the city calendar that uh, will get your family and yourselves out and about our city during this holiday season. With me now is Kathleen Bascom, the Dean of the Cathedral of St. Paul. Welcome to City Spotlight, Kathleen. Thank you, Mayor County. Talk to us a little bit about uh, some of the things that uh, are going on at St. Paul and uh, how St. Paul is involved in cool congregations. St. Paul's got involved in cool congregations about four, four and a half years ago. I just came here then. So there was a, there was a, a, a team that kind of became cohesive around sustainability issues. I think the, the parish has a long history of interest in care for the earth and, and care for our city. And I think, you know, those strands you know, have been there and been being uh, woven here for a long time. And in fact, if you go way back, um, Anglicans really love the creation. You can see it in our stained glass windows, and it's always been uh, uh, an area of importance. So four or five years ago, this team went to a workshop hosted by Iowa Power and Light, and uh, they got some ideas that they brought home here to St. Paul's. Um, the ones that I'm aware of are that they started uh, setting up laptops and things after church and helping individual members to calculate their carbon footprints and challenging people to reduce that by 10%, sort of like a tithe. Um, they also had a... Uh, How did you convince anybody that that was important? Again, I don't think I did. I think uh, Deacon Muffy Harmon has been a member here for many years and a quite a member in our city, and she's preached this, um, a lot of these more contemporary issues of the earth for decades, I would say. So, and, and these are people who are, are interested in their full lives, in the, the sustainability of our earth. So, um, but yeah, they had to wean people to come, you know, the individual members to come and participate. They got our youth involved in a, uh, a light bulb giveaway, I think, over the holidays. And uh, Sarah reminded me. You mean the me, compact for us and kind uh -huh, of thing? Uh -huh, and switch and, out. Uh-huh, right? encouraging okay. people to switch out. And um, the Sarah. The 60-second change that will make all the difference. Of cool congregations tells me that uh, 120 tons um, of, was saved, right, of carbon emissions um, through those the, that switch out. Um, it took us a longer time to figure out how to recycle here. Um, but just recently, we've connected with somebody especially aimed at uh, smaller businesses that was affordable for us and real helpful for the kind of recycling we um, have needed to do. Talk to us about recycling, what, what, uh, because the city does a recycling uh, at 
the residential level, but right. you do something different than that? Talk to yeah, because I'm not sure that's open to us as a church, is it? Well, so what you're saying is, is for business and for churches and, mm -hmm. and that uh, you then hire private contractors yes. to help and, you and with Yes, and that yourself. was tough in the, uh, again, I've been here five years and for a few years we would look into that and those uh, kind of people who are resources for, say, principal or the businesses around us were so expensive that we really had a hard time doing it. And so individuals would take things home. But a, uh, a co-op has arisen that you buy in to mm -hmm. be part of the co-op and that you sort of buy the receptacles. They came and analyzed what our our needs were, which are mainly paper. Churches go through a lot of paper, yeah. even when you try to hold it down. Um, they come weekly or bi -week, um, every other week um, themselves. They sort for us, and it's a really minimal price, like $25 a month. So, That's voila, finally, yeah, yeah. finally we've got that um, going. And then lastly for us, um, issues of water kind of became huge for us in the last couple of years. So those Let's are talk a little bit specifically about what is the church done itself in your building and on your grounds that has, you feel, uh, made a, an impact not only on, on the environment, but also maybe uh, is that example that shows your congregation the good things that you're doing? Well, again, um, the last two years, we've been very focused on the outside of our building. We had a, an eyesore, dilapidated parking lot. Um, once there had been tenements to our north, and about in the 1960s, uh, I think the church may have even bought those buildings. They were later taken down. People moved other places. I don't know all the history of that. But, and for many years, um, it was a parking lot out back. Paved asphalt to about inches of a few beautiful trees, uh, mm -hmm. ash trees, unfortunately, but beautiful, mature trees. But again, no, no sign of the earth, no... No, nothing growing um, on our north lot for, for 50 years. It became dilapidated. Um, I got involved with flood recovery efforts after the 2008 floods, worked with the Red Cross, and then we had a team here who was going to rebuild homes in Birdland and do other uh, things. And so when we knew we needed to do something better out north, uh, that group from Cool Congregations, who we call our um, Care of Creation Cloister, they interfaced with us and said, you know, we've got to do something. Care of Creation Cloister. That's yes. A, that's a good one. Yes. Like yes. They said, can't we do something better for the earth when we're going to take, when we're going to redo this surface anyway? And I said, and can't we do something better for the people downstream? You know, this is a real issue. Um, the urban peace... Um, of the flooding that we've been seeing in Iowa, we need to model, you know, what urban people can do. Uh, to, so what, to, did, what did you guys okay, do? What so, was the plan? Well, we started with uh, um, a charrette. We, were, we found folks from RDG who were willing to work pro bono with us. We mm -hmm. had an advisor from Drake University, the Environmental History Department. And then we invited our neighbors. And that was maybe the most beautiful part of this story. Uh, Pace, Orchard Place, um, Principal, other businesses across the way, Oak Ridge neighborhood came over. Mm -hmm. And we gathered everyone, um, Quest, now CenturyLink, and our own folks, and our diocesan people, because we are a center for all the churches in Iowa, so they come here regularly. Um, we gathered and said, what can we do with this land? What do we need? and how can it be good and sustainable? So we regraded the lot, um, we put in swaths of permeable paving, which also are embedded, uh, there are huge pipes that um, are filtered pipes that are underneath in lots of gravel. And the idea is that the water flows to those swaths. The pipes that, and, you know, it takes a long time to percolate out they move the water then to a crescent of rain gardens that go around the whole, uh, pretty much three quarters of our land now in the back. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, one major biocell where the soil is about um, eight foot deep of beautiful soil so that the plants that have these long roots 
to take in the water Did, are planted are they there. Native Iowa grasses. Every and, bit of our yes, yeah. everything we planted is um, is native, and uh, especially looking to some of those root systems and and also to beauty because we wanted to also be a place where people can come and downtown. Just save those ash trees. Yeah, we kept, we kept, uh, we did lose two and kept three. We heard that maybe we would have 30 years, hopefully, that mm -hmm. we could still enjoy them. Um, so we kept those and we added 13 other um, trees. What, now, how did you diversify your species base? Um, did you, are they, are they oaks or are they, what kind of trees did you? Those are Kentucky coffee uh -huh. trees. I think we still have, and we have, um, I think one that's different, and we have four to come that'll be on the Pleasant Street side uh, that are still kind of being decided. And we did go with our architects' uh, desires. We were helped uh, majorly by early on Polk County Soil and Water Conservation were advisors and gave us the first small grant. Then the Department of Natural Resources gave us $100,000 um, toward this project, which really made it viable for us. Only about you know, it was only about a third or a fourth of the total cost of everything. So other private donors got in excited, and we're about 90% um, funded in that. Um, so, and lastly, most exciting to me was the educational collaborative. We thought, well, while we're doing all this, couldn't people learn? And so, um, again, PACE and their sort of day school youth the um, downtown school children, uh, sort of third and fourth grade age group, a couple mm -hmm. of their classes got involved, and Oak Ridge neighborhood and our own kids. And we about every month or two have um, educational days where they learn about these uh, sustainability issues, whether it's permeability of the soil, uh, runoff into the streams, the native plants, um, and what we can do. Um, as urban people. Those are sort of present and ideas moving into the future. Any other changes you, the congregation and you are thinking about making to your building and your own? I was going to say, I think we definitely need uh, to move inside. Mm -hmm. um, our, our building is 1885, and so we work with some of the limits of that. But in our future, I would say in the next four or five years, the furnace, um, uh, some of the electrical situations, we, we really need to work on what the building itself um, is doing. We, we've switched out a lot of light bulbs ourselves, but sure. we need to go, we need to go further. Oh, something Those, else, yeah. the future. Yeah. There is an alley next door that uh, a lot of pedestrians use that I think is sort of a joint city St. Paul's and Pace, you know, we're all there together. I would love to see it transformed um, someday. I don't know how, how we could all work on that, but that could be a wonderful. I think it'd be a great demonstration for alleys throughout the city mm -hmm. and uh, show what the possibilities are and, and how that might work. Um, Kathleen, thank you very much for visiting with us. As we uh, wrap up City Spotlight for this year. We hope that uh, not only will you watch it today, but at the uh, times and uh, days on your screen that uh, as it rolls by. In addition, I hope that you'll take note of uh, some of the great honors that we've received uh, this year and the last couple of years for the City of Des Moines and our citizens. I'm Frank County, Mayor of Des Moines. Thank you for watching. This is City Spotlight.